Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Karen Brinkley. I'm the CEO of the Brisbane Institute, Queensland's independent think tank. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this session, Homelessness in Brisbane is Poverty and Necessity. In February this year, the Brisbane Institute ran a forum emerging out of our work in population growth, looking at household affordability and homelessness from a Queensland perspective. And at that time, of course, we were in the wake of the global financial crisis, uh, from which, of course, Australia has been said to have largely emerged unscathed. But nevertheless, we have seen the numbers of homeless in our community increase significantly as families struggled uh, to keep their grip on their mortgages. And then came the natural disaster events of December and January and February, and the mounting list of towns and shires affected by flooding, that shocking inland tsunami uh, in Toowoomba and its downstream communities uh, on the 10th of January, the inexorable progression of floodwaters into Brisbane, and then the shocking cyclone in the north of our state that saw even more families lose their homes. There are stories, gut-wrenching, heartbreaking stories attached to every person who will be sleeping rough tonight. And one of the people who cares about those stories is Anthony Ryan. Anthony established the Eddie's Street Van alongside brother Damien Price in 1998. And with that initiative has made an enormous daily contribution to the Brisbane community. He's also established the Paddy's Van to assist Brisbane's homeless, street kids and the elderly. And starting with two days a week, these programs have grown to provide daily assistance to Brisbane's community. In recent years, Anthony has extended his help to South Africa, developing the Mamiki Foundation to assist underprivileged children there as well as here. Anthony has networked and devoted his talent and time to empowering others, people like you and me today, to reach out to those in need. He's an inspiration, and it's my great privilege to ask you to join me in making Anthony Ryan welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I want to start off with a story, I think, which for me captures uh, a little bit about the homeless uh, character that I fell in love with pretty much from an early, early stage. And please don't think I'm being, I'm romanticising homelessness, but this is an issue for me that, uh, or a story for me that captures uh, a challenge to my stereotype of what homelessness was about. I started working about 13 years ago at a place called King George Square, at a place called King George Square, King George Square. And there, in the old King George Square, where the water fountains were, we used to gather. I used to work with a van called Rosie's Van, which is still very well known around Brisbane. And my first day, I was very nervous. I didn't know first night how I was going to be perceived, whether or not they'd accept me when I'd try to have conversations with them. There was a guy called Peter that welcomed me straight over. And Peter sat down with me. He got me a coffee and we sat down and started having a chat. Peter and I developed a friendship, a great friendship over the years. And he was a great practical joker. About two years after I started the van, Peter became um, aware that I was engaged, became good friends with my wife, Rebecca and decided to play this practical joke on me. We used to bring university students and school students onto the van. And during that time, uh, it was really interesting to see that, how, the way they interac interacted. Peter got, used to get along very well, particularly with students from one of the private schools um, in the city. And they came up to me after one of the Tuesday nights in the van and said, we've played a practical joke on you. There's no way you're gonna know what that practical joke is. And when you find out, you'll know it's me. So about three weeks later, four weeks later, I kept on going, going to Peter and saying, mate, it didn't work, it hasn't happened. And he said, it will, it'll happen. Anyway, one day I found myself going down to look at a place where we were going to have a honeymoon down the Gold Coast. We were driving in my car. And I said to Rebecca, where are we going? And she didn't know where, exactly where we are going. I said, just get the Refidex, please. Go to the Refidex. And... Um, and tell me exactly the directions that I need to go. As I was driving, I just hear Rebecca in this really terse, angry voice, quivering voice, say to me, pull over. I said, Rebecca, I'm on, the, I'm on the freeway, I can't. Pull over now. Got progressively louder. So I eventually pulled over thinking that something had been wrong and she was holding up a women's G-string. 
And I looked at her and I said, well, I don't know what it is. And she, and she said, tell me the truth, what's going on? And I said, I have no idea how that G-string got into my glove box. And at that point, I just went, bloody Peter. And from that point on, I rang him. I rang, rang him that, that, that afternoon at the hostel and said, you got, you got me. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And then all the students at the school the week after knew because Peter had told them on the streets. For me, the definition of, of homelessness is, is quite quite a curly one and I want to just share with you some very traditional traditional examples or traditional definitions. Homelessness is usually defined as not having a house to live in but is also about having little or no safety or security. A homeless person may have no shelter at all or a shelter that com compromises their health or safety. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare defines homelessness as currently living on the street or living in crisis or refuge accommodation, or living in temporary arrangements without security, for example, moving between the residence of friends or relatives, living in squats, caravans, dwellings, or living in boarding houses. It's also defined as living or encompasses living in unsafe family circumstances where child abuse or domestic violence is a threat or has occurred. Living on a very low income, and facing costly expenses or a personal crisis. So what is the issue here in Australia? Well, I just want to look at it before we move on. Tonight within Australia, half of Australia's homeless will stay with friends or family. We're talking about 105,000 people tonight. About two in every seven will find a bed in a boarding house. A lucky one in every seven will find a bed in the homeless service system. One in every seven will sleep rough on the streets of our cities and towns. With regard to that, with that definition, it's all encompassing, so very hard to sort of put our hand, fingers on exactly what is a homeless person. I think the, I suppose the stereotypical homeless issue is one where the person is sleeping rough out on the streets. But for me, my experience with over the last 13 years is definitely not that. And definitely the fact that someone who really can't call a place his own home, I find is also, uh, can be put up into the statistics. So I'm going to go back to a story now of a particular person. Um, and the, probably the, the one man in this world from the streets that has really affected the way that I started looking at the issue a little bit differently. I need to be honest with you. Uh, I came from a very, very good family background. And I came working with the streets with very strong stereotypes. Stereotypes where I felt that particularly the homeless person within Australia was there out of choice. That he was there because he was lazy, that he was there because uh, he lacked the initi uh, initial impetus to give himself and get himself up off the streets. Terry challenged my understanding and my stereotype of the homeless. When I started working the streeties, there was one streetie that I hated serving on the vans. And can I also say, I need to go another step forward. For me, the service of the vans is, is important, but the, the vans in itself are not there just to serve food or coffee. They're there to build relationships and to build self-esteem within, within the people on the streets. With Terry, I think I failed from the outset to do that. Terry came onto the streets. He'd been there for a lot longer before I started. And he was a reject amongst the other rejects, if you know what I'm saying. Terry was ostracised by the homeless community. Terry um, had incredibly poor hygiene. In fact, the streeties who had been monitoring it, and I'd imagine monitoring it quite closely, said that Terry hadn't had a bath for two years by the time that I first met him. Terry didn't use uh, or take his clothes off at any stage. Even when he was going to the toilet, he used to use um, the back of his pants, there was a split on his pants, and he used to keep it together with safety pins. When he'd go to the toilet, he'd undo the safety pins and then he'd go to the toilet and often he would miss. So when Terry came come out onto the streets, 
his odour was quite overpowering. And I, um, as I was starting in my initial stages, felt that I just couldn't really talk to him. The idea, I believe, of the vans, or the idea, of, I believe, of working with, with the disempowered is very much about being present to them, about them knowing that when you are with them, there's no other place in the world that you would rather be. That's where the transformation will take place, not in the sense of charity. With Terry, I failed to do that. I used to get him his coffee, I used to almost push him off to the side so, we, so he could not affect the other people on the streets. He was quite manic in his behaviour. Terry would often, in a frantically, frantic, manic approach, come to the van and demand a coffee in a particular way. And he used to speak with a stutter. He said, I, I, need, I, need, I need my coffee now. I want my coffee now. Give me my coffee now. I need four, four sugars, four, 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 four five sugars. I need, I, I need some Milo in it. I need, and I want some cordial in it tonight. I need cordial. And he'd give you, give you a real sense of nervousness and rush as you're making, making that coffee for him. As he would say that, he would then go off to the other side of the street. Some of the streeties would throw water on him and say, get a bath, Terry. Terry did it really, really tough. But for me, I didn't care. I wanted to remove him from, from the, the easy... Well, it was more easy to push him off to the side. I remember talking to people about presence and about how if we are to transform people and to get them off the streets, it's not about that sense of charity, but it's more about that sense of spending time with them and hearing their story. And then when I was saying this in one of the debriefs to the group, I realised how much of an imposter I had been. I had not at any stage, I suppose, talked to Terry. I'd stereotyped him and pushed him into a little neat bundle. What took place one afternoon, which I suppose was a sense of luck, I got a really bad cold. And I thought, tonight I'm going to speak to Terry. I won't worry about the smell because I can't smell him. And I'll sit down and I'll have a really good conversation with him. So here he goes, Terry came in, we had this really good conversation and it was more that in that time when I got him a coffee and that sense of surprise that I sat down with him at that time and spent about two hours with him, you could see his body language change, you could see his shoulders drop, he wasn't as tense. In that time, in that frantic conversation, and he used to talk about cars all the time, he had this incredible photographic memory of registration, car registrations, models of cars, types of cars, um, the, the, uh, the weather needle that used to be on top of one of the buildings in the city, I forget which one it was, SGIO building, I think. He used to be able to say, oh, it's, going, it's raining now, it's going to be raining this afternoon, it's going to be cold, it's cold. He'd talk, as you'd say, that a car would be driving past, you'd talk about the car, and I, that goes from zero to 100 kilometres in 25 seconds. I didn't care. And during that time, he just kept speaking and speaking and speaking. I reckon in that first two-hour conversation I had with Terry... I probably got in less than 50 words, and he would have got in thousands. Terry needed someone to listen to him. And I can remember driving away from the van that night, not really thinking of what had taken place. And I'd driven about 10 metres down the street where Terry comes running in front, almost bowled him over. So that would have been good, helping someone on the streets and then running them over. And then sitting down with Terry, and Terry went round to the, 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 the mirror and asked me to wind it down, and he just went, f -f 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 thank you so much. And then I drove off. Over the next month and a half, I got to know Terry really well. We started going beyond the surface, and to really, even when the cold went, I didn't really mind talking to Terry. One night he came about six weeks later, eight weeks later, very frantically, manically, asking me to sit and speak with him. I said, yes, Terry, I'll just set the van up and we'll go from there. No, he said, I need to speak to you now, I need to speak to you now. Get yourself a coffee, get yourself a coffee. We sat next to the water fountain of King George Square. He started talking about cars and I thought, oh, I thought this conversation was going to be a little bit different. I thought it was going to go to the next level. What Terry did at that time, as he started talking about a car, all of a sudden he started talking about his own car. And so therefore, from my own sort of neat little box that I'd placed Terry in, 
I realised at one stage he'd had a car. At one stage he'd had a normal life. He was driving his own car. He wasn't Terry, the person that, that was living on the streets of Brisbane that had him bathed for years. He started talking about a con a how he was driving up in Melbourne and he came into a, an off-ramp, was going up the wrong way of the off-ramp. And he realised, as he was starting to say this, he started crying and started, and I realised in his mind, he was back in the car, reliving the memory of what was actually taking place in the story that he was telling me. He started talking about how he realised on the long, long way up the off-ramp, there was a car coming towards him. And before he could do anything, the car had crashed into him at full speed. And the way he described it is that the steering wheel jackknifed into his body. One thing I forgot to tell you about Terry, which is now important to the story. Terry is not the famous bag man um, of, of, of Tawong, but he certainly was a bag man. And he had bags all over his body, all over his, um, all over his legs. He had rubbish bags from Coles and Woolworths or whatever, filled with rubbish. He used to hoard and he never could throw things out. And that also added to his aroma. I never really realised why he did that. As he started telling me the story of how the steering wheel jackknifed into his body, he told me, and, and he was screaming at this stage, reliving it, how his hands were stuck down either side of his body and his bones were sticking out through his arms. So they were complete, compound fra com complete fractures. And he was talking about the pain. And then at that stage, I kept myself, Terry, it wasn't your fault. There was nothing you could do thinking there was this trauma of this car crash. But then he continued to go forth. Terry then spoke about his wife that was sitting next to him in the car. And realised in that car crash that she had died instantly in that crash. Instantly blaming himself for the death of his wife because he went up the off-ramp. And then he talked to me about his daughter and how in the back he realised his daughter was dead as well started crying, I cried, listening to it, thinking about this broken man. And then he started talking even more powerfully about his son who was still alive and he could see him in the rear vision mirror. His son was bleeding badly. He talked about trying to rip his arms off to get to his son to hold his son, realised his son was dying. He couldn't. He talked about the pain, about the sense of failure, the frustration. He watched his son bleed to death while he was pinned. The plastic bags all of a sudden made sense. The scars from his arms were what he was trying to hide from his own consciousness every day. That he didn't have to wake up every morning, look down at his scars and realise that's right, I accidentally killed my family. That conversation that night stayed with me forever. Has stayed with me forever. And it haunts me and it challenges me. Sorry about the crying. We only need <laughs> two tissues or something. Um, it haunts me. And every time, even if it's not a street person or ever, I always wonder what is their story? What are the shoes that they have walked in? How do they get to see me and be in front of me today? <laughs> Thank you. My father's in the audience. He's probably just calling me a big girl right now. Um, the transformation that took place afterwards, people began to know Terry's story. He's no longer around Brisbane, by the way, and Terry's not his real name. But the transformation started taking place because everyone then became determined to sit down with him over a coffee and have chats with him. Slowly, month by month, the plastic bag started disappearing. Slowly, he started getting what we would say, his act together. 
He started making friends and through the transformation of the relationships that took place around the van, he changed. I've got an appendix there for you. I'll ask if you could just go towards the sheets on your, on your table. You'll need appendix A. It says homelessness in Australia. This is the old teacher in me. I used to be a teacher a while back, so I wanted to give out a few handouts. I often get frustrated. I think it's impersonal if I have a little PowerPoint. I'd much rather you have something in your hands. This is by no means a full list of certain characteristics or incidences. This is just something that we've whacked down and I'll tell you a little bit about Africa in a minute of work that we've done in, in uh, work, working with corporate leaders. I want you to just have a look at that list. I've just told you Terry's story. If you could just look at that list and do your own social analysis, start with one aspect of Terry that you think could have been the initial step towards homelessness. And why, where did it go? Can you, can you almost tell his story? Can you almost tell why he ended up on the streets? I've done a simple one. And I'm just in the bottom left-hand corner, I start off with Terry saying, no social support. Terry got to a stage where, in one instant, his family was lost in a day. So through that no social support, I imagine if that had happened to me, my other brothers and sisters would come to my rescue. They'd realise the gravity of what had taken place. They'd take me under their wings and would support me. Terry didn't have an extended family. So when that incredible tragedy took place to him, it was all-encompassing. Terry then quickly developed manic behaviour. So if you go once again up on the left-hand side, you can see that there's that sense of manic behaviour there, or one of the characteristics. Then the poor communication skills. And slowly, he began his cycle towards homelessness. I want to just go back to my story of, of Terry. Could Terry help himself? After what that took place, perhaps, if he was a stronger character, if he, was a, if he was maybe had the networks around him, maybe Terry could have said, yep, yeah, I've had this terrible thing take place to me, but he could have rebuilt the bricks. But there's also the case that says, Terry, the homeless man, is homeless out of his control in many ways. And we as a society, how do we then work with a person such as Terry to rebuild the bricks? How do we sit with him to actually say, Terry, it's not your fault? A little bit of like that scene out of Goodwill Hunting, if you've seen it, where the boys that suffered sexual abuse. Robin Williams, the character, is saying to him, it's not your fault. Someone needed to intervene with Terry very early on the piece and say, Terry, it's not your fault. But that didn't exist. Somehow he found himself up on the streets of Brisbane, he was living in the streets of Brisbane, unassisted for years and years. I want to use another example. I'll use Tony, once again, not his real name, who's living at King George, sorry, not at King George Square, at Botanical Gardens. Tony, in another life, and we checked, checked this through, we, did, we did, did the history of it, Tony played A grade in the NRL, not in the, in the Sydney competition, at a very high level. He actually played a couple of A grade games for Western Suburbs during the era of Tommy Radonigas. Tony was, from all records, a fantastic football player someone who had the deep respect of the western suburbs community of Sydney. Tony lost his wife to cancer. And the more we got to know Tony through that time, that broke him. Tony developed a 
chronic alcohol abuse, addiction. He ended up finding himself on the streets of Brisbane, living in the back of the botanical gardens. During that time, Tony also talked about not having a family network or a, or a network of support. And he also developed cancer during that time. I can remember when we were serving at King George Square, our volunteers often had to walk Tony down because it had affected him and started eating away at his hip, the cancer, back to where he was living. We also then struggled to start putting him, trying to and striving to put him into a house, into some sort of um, circumstances where they could nurse him to his death. He refused. He did not want to live in a house. It was then that in, through conversations that we had with him, he talked about chronic sexual and physical abuse when he was a young fella, when he was a young man. The fact that he could never live in a, in, a, in a house again. The fact that the whole four walls, he felt totally, totally you know, caught up in that, like he was in a jail. I suppose what I'm trying to say in a really stumbling way is that homelessness is a complex issue. When I was a young man, when I first started it, young man, I was, when I was about in the mid-twenties when I first started, I realised from a very early set that I was wrong with my stereotypes. I was wrong with the fact that homelessness wasn't an issue. That it didn't need to be an issue. I kept on thinking, we can get these people off the streets, we can help them. But the more at the same time that I was doing my, my economics degree at University of Queensland, started realising that the more and more I started looking at the free market, and that the fact that the, the whole concept of the free market, there was the profit motive as well, and that was pretty much what drove the free market. That the complex, of, that the complex issue of homelessness was never going to give me any simple answers. I believe if we live in a free market economy, which I'm not criticising at all, but we live in a free market where the profit motive and to, to get to the top of the heap is one of the main drivers of that economy, the winners of that economy. The very nature of that means that there has to be people that are going to fall through the other end. And that is the aspect that we see around Brisbane. So for a person who often says, we don't need homelessness within Brisbane, the, the homeless person, the, the street bum doesn't need to be there, I think he's speaking from a position where they really don't understand the complexity of what homelessness is about. Can I ask you to just go to, you've got another piece of paper there, which is titled, The Waves and Reef Model. I want you to put the two sheets together. I'm going to call section A, so just a minute, I'm going to divide that room, divide that sheet into four sections. To your far left hand side, I'm going to say that's section A. So on the top of the hill, section B, and as you move across, the people standing on the side of the hill, on the right hand side of the hill, section C, and section D, and the people in the, in, in the water. Now this model has been used from, for, a lot, for quite a while and I think it's actually a little bit more topical at the moment when you look at the boat in the water and the people being crashed up on the rocks and brings together images of Christmas Island. That's not what this model is about. So if you look at D, that area, the boat, I want to imagine that that is the concept of homelessness within the streets of Brisbane. Here they are feeling that they've been washed up on the shore, that they don't really know, they're feeling powerless, they don't know how to get out of that situation. If you look up at the sea, I think a lot of us in this room, you've obviously come here because homelessness is something that you're either involved in or is an issue for you in your life or you're, or you're thinking about it, that C is those of us who are, know that there's a problem but we really don't know what to do about it or how to help. B up there where the lighthouse is, this wonderful drawing of the lighthouse on the top there. 
those people that sort of walk past, when I'm on the van, I think you can almost see these different types of people when you're working on the streets of Brisbane. Often, uh, where we're based on a Tuesday night is underneath the Turbot Street overpass on Roma Street. Often you'll get people walking past, through no fault of their own, but it happens, that will walk past the van as quickly as they can. Businessmen, business people, seeing that there's an issue there, but almost putting their blinkers on and getting to their train, getting to their bus, getting to their parked car. They don't want to know about it. They know it's there, but they want to get, there, get to home as quickly as possible. Often you'll get people who will grab their bags and their handbags and put it behind them so it can't be seen as they're walking past the homeless person. The only people that really do see that behaviour are the homeless people themselves. So they're your bees, the people that walk past, that don't really believe there's an issue. And then on the A, on the A side, there's those that don't believe there's an issue at all and they're, they're a little bit of what I was like before I started. My synopsis of today is very much about looking at that issue and asking you where you are. You're an A, B, C or D. I believe that there are three aspects of homelessness which will help the homeless situation. Some will say that they are simplistic. But for me, they're the only ones that will work. I think we need to go beyond the romanticism of the poor. I think a lot of people, such as myself, that work with the poor, believe that they've got all the answers for us, that we're living the wrong way, that our choices are the wrong choices, and because of the way we're living, we're causing them. I think that is wrong. Is I think that's just putting and reversing the situation. I believe the answer is presence. Most people that criticise the homeless, most people that criticise poverty, are those that really haven't spent time immersing themselves in it. I would challenge anybody who's sitting down with Terry once they really know Terry's story, I'd challenge any politician, I'd challenge any right-wing extremist, to say that Terry's there and he can get out of it. Certainly, if you hear his story, you can say, think objectively, yeah, it was tough, he could probably get out of it. But once you sit down with him and share a coffee and see his shaking hands, see his sense of frustration and confusion, see his depression that is so inbuilt into the way he operates, you understand that Terry can't get away from that. My criticism of street vans in the city, in any city in the world, my criticism of working with the poor, is often we go there thinking that we have the answers. And often we go there with a charity model. Now please do not hear me say that I don't believe in charity. I think charity is important. In fact, I got quoted in one of the newspapers just recently saying charity is crap. I don't mean that. I don't believe charity is crap. What I believe is charity in itself, I think, needs to be transformed to be able to lift the person, to be able to be with the person, to be able to hear their per that person, to be able to move them forward. So I think presence is a very important aspect of working with the home homeless. Think about relationship building. I think when you go beyond knowing that that is the person that, um, that wears the, uh, the Broncos shorts and the Broncos jersey on the street, to actually getting to know that that is Patrick is really important. To getting to know that Patrick's birthday is, is in August and that he loves, um, loves pizza. Now you go beyond that one Thing where it's the objective to the subjective. Once again, it's very closely related to presence. 
And then that sense of solidarity. Now, I've got a definition here of solidarity that I want to use that I think works in with the homeless. Solidarity takes place that when we recognise that together we both have advantages and disadvantages of our different social backgrounds. I'll use an example. Down in Krilpa Park about seven years ago, I was in the middle of marking all these end of term papers. I was panicking, didn't think I was going to get it done in time. I was on the street serving a little breakfast of, of ham and eggs and toast and a, and a really bad cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, um, one of the Indigenous um, uh, regulars, who I bet started becoming really, uh, I really liked him. We ended up having some really good, challenging conversations. He was a great artist, an exceptional artist. He used to do his artwork in the middle of the park. He actually said to me at the end of this really stressful day, enjoy your day, mate. And as I look back at Tony, I thought, you little bastard. Here he is, painting, sitting down, doing his artwork. He was at Kurupa Park on the side of the Brisbane River. He just had a fantastic feat of my terrible cooking, or my, the, the students' terrible cooking. And he had a point, that we all, both have advantages and disadvantages to our own lives. But in some way, it's through that sense of really listening and being present to each other, I think we'll arrive at some sort of answer towards homelessness. At the moment, I don't think we're anywhere near it. I know I'm preaching to the converted. Most policies, most things that take place in our society never take place at the cold place. Now, I could be wrong, but in 13 years of being on the streets, and in some, sometimes in those years where I have been there five days a week, I have never seen one policymaker come down and ask my opinion about the streets. Not once in 13 years. I'll often see a lot of things taking place, but I'll never see someone underneath the Turbot Street Bridge or the side of the old King George Square who was asking me why I thought or what I thought I needed the homeless or what, what I thought would be good for the homeless in that situation. So I don't have any simple answers. I don't have really a message. I'm not an academic. My message to you today is more about wanting to tell the stories of those people. To use that social analysis model to get you to think, to possibly challenge you if you were one of the A's or the B's on the reef and wave model. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got about um, 20 minutes for questions um, with Anthony. I've got a couple you know, if you need me to get you started and warm you up a little bit. But we also have some roving microphones um, that we would really like you to um, put your hand up when the microphone gets to you. You need to hold it right up close to your face because they don't pick up uh, your comments or questions otherwise. Does anybody want to start? Yes, excellent. Your examples have mostly been, have all been of men. What about uh, homeless women on the streets? Are there as many of them or are they more hidden than the men? Uh, what, what's your name, sorry? Judy. Judy. Judy, great question. We find, particularly in my work on the streets, it has always been with regard to um, bringing a van in and the medium of the van, so the, the thing that sort of is the gathering point is we're bringing some sort of barbecue or some sort of food. And then, even though that's not the real reason why we're there, it's more about that sense of parent presence and uh, relationship building. We have found, particularly in the streets, that it's almost a 95% um, mix of males, 5% females. Now, I will go back to Tony. Um, 
Um, there's so many things I could tell you about Tony's and their Terry's. Tony admitted to me in his conversation about the loss of his wife and the sorrow um, and the depression that took place as a result of that loss. That he was the western suburbs forward, the tough man. He was the enforcer. And you bring to mind, if you know Tommy Radonigas, he was in playing in that era of rugby league. Now, I can't imagine him going to Tommy Radonigas and saying, Tommy, I'm, I really need to talk to you about love. Tommy would have just looked at him and laughed. So here it was, there was a man such as Tony, totally trying to cope with the death of his number one partner in his life. He didn't feel that he could talk to people. What I found with streeties, and particularly females who come onto the streets, young females or, or women, that they tend to be able to drop their pride a little bit and say, I need help. Uh, I, I, um, now, I have no, no data to support that, about that why they're, they're, they're less, but it's, it's my hunch, and it's certainly from my conversations with the streeties, that they feel as if uh, women particularly will come straight up to you, usually on the street and say, where's some hostels that I can stay to tonight? And then you just look at your register and start working from there. Most guys, and you say, hey, who's new on the street, are you fine? Yeah, mate, I'm right. Yeah, all right. You got a blanket? And that's it. And then they start getting into their cycle from there. I think you want to know the name, so it's John. G'day, John. Uh, I apologise for coming in late. I was at another session and I walk slow. That's OK. I, I have read your material in the time I've been here. I'm very well aware of it. And uh, I, th I thought it's helpful to say that I uh, attended both of the verdict and inquiries in Brisbane dealing with the question of homelessness. And uh, I'm sure you'll be fully aware of it. Uh, and you've just been quoting some sort of statements, nothing has improved. Nothing has improved. And uh, so I'll just give you one example because you might want to make comments on it. Um, we've got bridges uh, up north. I was in Townsville for 10 years and um, it w I got there when Althea came, so they had to bring in a lot of support. And uh, I joined the Townsville Welfare Council we used to set up uh, whatever needs there were, we'd set up a committee and deal with it. So one of them was family, emergency, accommodation, Townsville. So you could imagine the people we'd get at that. These people would come into the town and they would be more than desperate. Uh, and it, we ultimately got a solution for that one. But we also, the Aborigines were coming over from Palm Island and of course, they were called the bridge people. Uh, and they weren't only alone there because any passing poor white would end up under the bridge. And so we, we had to help them. Uh, there used to be in South Townsville uh, a, a big old restaurant. So they turned that into a place where they could go in and have a meal a day. And there, when they came in there, well then they could get the advice, so we organised a whole lot of people that could help them, whatever they wanted. But that centre was their centre. They could relax there, they could have a meal there, they could get to meet each other and their problems were being helped. You yes. can't say solved. What do you say about that? I could come at that from about five or th 500 different angles. I agree with you that the, the issue of homelessness is not going to improve. I don't think it will ever improve because our structures aren't built to cope. Our structures, um, our whole society is geared towards success. Uh, that's, that's what drives us and therefore we will always have the issue that people aren't going to be successful um, from a financial perspective. I want to go from a different angle though. We just started a bit of an experiment um, and we took just recently six people over to South Africa into a town, into a town called, or a city called Cape Town. Physically awesome city, I think one of the most beautiful cities in the world. But it's extraordinary poverty. 
my foundation, Mamiki Foundation, does work uh, in orphanages there, uh, in HIV clinics, and a couple of small um, free schools. Kailicha, the Cape Flats region, has about 3 million people. Uh, out of those 3 million people, and that's not official, by the way, because there's so many refugees in there, they don't really know how many. Of those, what they are totally convinced in, in the Cape Flats region, one in three have HIV. So it's an extraordinary statistic. One in three out of three million people have HIV. There is, from an observer before you go in there, you think, this is not a place of hope. Now, the six people that we took to go into that as a bit of an experiment, and I know other organisations do this, but we put a little bit of a different bent on it. We wanted to take future CEOs and managing directors. So we took a director from Yahoo 7, we took someone from Macquarie Bank, we took one of the executive from Brisbane Racing Club, we took someone from uh, the state manager of MLC, we took a couple of young uh, millionaires and we took them over there. The whole idea, not to immerse themselves in the poverty of Cape Flats, because I have been over there and I've seen people who've gone over who are volunteers to try and find themselves. And they realise very quickly that they're never going to solve the problem. They come back to Brisbane or come back to Sydney or wherever in Australia, totally disenchanted. What we wanted to do is to do a little bit of a different bent where the majority world, which is the poor, um, if you're not aware of that term, but most of you would be, that the, that the term majority world, that the people of South Africa, and they're living in the shanties, and we, the minority world, often are just so caught up in our own lifestyles that we never really experience the other. And so by taking these six people in, I got criticised in the program because part of it was to go to the Reds game versus the Stormers at Newland Stadium. Now, I'll admit, I love watching the Reds play. But that wasn't the reason we, why we went to Cape Town. We wanted to say to the, C, the future CEOs and managing directors, this is the world that you're used to. We're not making you feel guilty about this world. In fact, we're affirming in many ways your creativity, your sense of entrepreneurship. No, I didn't say that right. Um, your, your, uh, your ability, your drive, your intelligence. But at the same time, in the minority world, now have a step into the majority world. And when you come back to Brisbane, how can you feel a bit more effective in what you are trying to do? The thing that blew us away over there was because most of the people that went, went there had never stepped into the majority world, never understood what it was like, often came in with their own prejudice. One of them even said before they went, I want to teach the Africans how to get out of the slums. That was his statement. One of the things that we, he wanted to do, we said, what's your main drive? Well, I want to teach the people, there's a little Malawi camp. Um, I want to teach them how they can have a sense of hope and get out of their poverty. I think it was after the first night after he'd worked in the orf into the orphanage where 100% of the kids in the orphanage had HIV and they couldn't get access or free access to any retroviral drugs. He knew that those kids would never get out of their poverty. You know, the structural violence that was taking place within South Africa was never going to allow them to get out of that poverty. So it rocked him. So I suppose my answer to you is, I don't have an answer. Because I think our society, unless we actually are prepared to move from our comfortability to go down and actually have a conversation, to really ask the, you know, some of the tough questions that are going to make us feel uncomfortable, I don't think we'll move from that, from that situation of, of poverty. Let's move away from homelessness, but of poverty within, within Australia. Hello, Anthony. Uh, you know my name's Paula. Uh, a couple of comments. One is that uh, I know the measures they endeavour to take in Townsville to remove the Indigenous off the tourist strand has actually resulted in other people 
all, all people being unable to enjoy it to the fullest, and in addition, an increase in the numbers that actually um, prevail in that area. So we, we don't have an answer on that one. The second thing I'd like to say is where people are aware, um, they can't always break through for an outcome. I've been working with a group of families who have a bit of money, not, not real wealthy, but have a bit of money and have adult uh, children with schizophrenia. They've been trying to, they have a plan, they bought a property, they're trying to build a, 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 an accommodation where they could have uh, on-site manager 24-7 just to monitor them. A lot of these are high-functioning people. But as you know from your experiences, the tendency for the schizophrenics to, it, on, at a bad time, if they're not giving with their medication, you end up on the streets and uh, there's a downhill spiral from there. <clears throat> what these families are trying to do is to set their adult loved ones up in an accommodation that can carry on after they have passed on themselves or are no longer to, uh, able to keep them because these people are in their 70s. And they have been confronted by all sorts of um, difficulties from the Department of Communities here, from the planning, uh, urban planning, from the NIMBYs. They've had the plan on the books for two years uh, over two years, it, it, the price of the accommodation has gone up over a million dollars to accommodate ridiculous uh, bureaucratic requirements for the planning. And then there's a bending over backwards to the NIMBY neighbours who just who have their house on the market anyway and just don't want that place mm. there. Mm. It's over. It's over. Car spaces, height of the roof, heritage listing, traffic when none of these people has, has a car, they, because of the medication they can't drive. There's a whole lot of issues there where there's absolutely made it virtually impossible. And if, if, they, if it's followed through to, to an outcome, the plan at the present stage will be unviable financially. These people will be... And why do you say, Paula, is the main reason behind that? Is it because the structure is not... Uh, the, the planning bureaucracy is one thing, Correct. which is, is, is a critical issue. Yes. Um, there is, there, that is not sufficiently fluid for these things to move forward mm. uh, efficiently mm. and effectively. Mm. And a lot of that is personal bias in the planning, just plain bureaucratic bloody-mindedness. It's very frustrating. The, I, I, I've... Uh, I've got two similar examples, and I've got to be careful, so I don't want to get in trouble um, with my stories, but uh, or in my examples. But we were moved once from the botanical gardens down by the river, uh, officially moved by the authorities, and said we can't, and it went through the, the channels of, of, of um, government, that we were no longer allowed to be there. And we knew the reason, as we, where we were was in the corner botanical gardens, as you entered near the Brisbane River. And the hotels and the restaurants around there did not want us, did not want the homeless to be in their region. Uh, they were successful in their wish and they were moved on. Uh, we used to cook a breakfast, as I said, down at Krupa Park. Residents and people complained. One day, one of the home we came in, the homeless said, don't bother cooking, uh, because we used to use the public hot plates there. I said, why? And they said, well, they've come in and they've turned them down. So we couldn't cook on them. That's before we started buying our own barbecues. And there were decisions, simple decisions that were being made. And instead of actually looking for the solution, they were trying to move the solution away from their little area of the world. Because they didn't want to be reminded of the ugliness or the, or the problem of poverty. So I, I agree with you. That uh, we're never going to have, at this stage, the way we're going, solutions. Last question. Uh, just Hi, um, Anthony. My name's Desiree. G'day, Desiree. Um, coming from a practitioner perspective, what role do you think um, state government could play in reducing homelessness in Brisbane? How, how do you see Ooh. them being effective? I, I'm just interested from, you know, that practicality of things. Um, I don't have, I honestly do not have a neat answer 
for, for that because at the moment the structures that exist we can't go forward um, to say that you're going to put a roof over their head is not an answer and you've got your Tonys who, who need long term um, counselling you know, and, and sense of support I believe the issue is so broad that I could not give you an answer in I think I've got three minutes what I believe, I want to keep going back to my three statements though that sense of presence, that sense of, that sense of relationship building, you know, sitting down with people, listening to their stories. I think it's such complex that if you said this is answer A, that it's really going to affect, they're not going to tick the boxes for, for so many different personalities out of that. It's really more about looking at an answer that's tailor-made to certain, certain personalities. Um, as Paula was just talking about, a really smart approach to looking at... Um, young people that, are, that have the suffering schizophrenia. Great. Listen to their story, understand what they need, and then come up with a solution. How do you work out with the people with the, the, who, on the streets of Brisbane, doesn't make sense sometimes. They're gambling addicts and they're homeless. You feel like you're saying, don't go to the TAB. But then you realise that the data behind most of the gambling addicts that are on the streets is chronic sexual abuse when they were younger. And that it's almost a deference mechanism every time they think about what happened to them, I've got to do something, I've got to forget about it, I've got to move on. So it's about finding different issues for different, for different solutions for the, the different issues. Sorry. One more question from me, uh, and it's for this audience. Um, Anthony, what would be the one thing that you would have all of us here do today as we walk out the door? What do you want us to do today? Uh, I think uh, the solution is not saying every one of you want your volunteers on the streets of, um, of Brisbane. I think it's about finding your own niche and working, because there's so many different complex issues of poverty, you know, as, I, as I have alluded to. But it's finding something that... I thought I was going to be speaking to a, more of a school, school sort of... Um, age group, you're not school age, and uh, one of the things that, that uh, I believe is that when you're looking at something, you've got to find something that floats your boat, um, if that makes sense. So I don't want everyone to go here and say, we're going to go fix the homeless issue, but certainly at your age, I would doubt that there's a person in this room that hasn't said at some stage, I know I should be doing something, I know I should be getting out there and getting my hands dirty. I know I should. I know that's wrong. I see it. Not many people actually go from that point to actually saying, "Well, I'm about to go do it. I'm going to take the phone. I'm going to ring up an agency and see if I can volunteer." And my, I often um, used to say to this, my my students and used to bore them so much. They used to hear, you know, "Here he goes again." I used to always refer once again to another Robin Williams movie, that Dead Poet Society and that sense of carpe diem, that really, um, using that line, all of us are going to be dead within the next 100 years. We're all going to be pushing up daisies, as he says. What are you going to do with your life to actually make a difference that when you're coming to your last five or six breaths, which is going to happen to every one of us, you're going to be looking back and you're not going to be thinking about anything else and you're going to be saying, really, what is it that I did that really satisfied me? that really challenged the very essence of me to be the human being I wanted to be. Indeed, you've just done what I was going to ask you to do. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank uh, a very courageous, inspirational um, man and uh, teacher, Anthony Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.